And the podcast will begin in five, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, ah, exciting. Ooh. Welcome to the podcast. Dish Wallace bassist Scott Alexander. Ooh. Scott Alexander, how are you? Uh, doing great now that we're here. I we put we worked so hard to put this together to yes. get me in here. I feel like I talked to Michael Mike. at mm -hmm. um we had a Los Angeles show Dishwalla did at a place called The Rose in Pasadena years, years ago. ago. And so uh, we had talked about it maybe right at the beginning of the podcast about doing something about coming on down this Filipino podcast. <laughs> and I think at that point I was maybe like, I don't know, you know, I don't know how many people are <laughs> going to be paying attention to this. So I've, I, over the years, I've kind of like followed you and followed you. And I think we we were trying to put something together and then COVID hit. Yes. And um, the year that COVID hit was also the 25th anniversary of Pet Your Friends, of our debut oh, the, record. Yeah, yeah. So that meant that we, we were really planning on working a lot that year and, and um, doing a bunch of touring in support of, of the 25th anniversary of our, our first record. And, uh, and it was just all fell apart. And more and more, just I as know. it progressed, it fell apart. And I didn't make it out to California. And uh, so... I Wait, just, you're not... I thought you were from California. Well, yeah, I, I am from California, but I live in a state called Idaho. Ah, uh, see, you like how yeah. I brought that in? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've lived in, you know, so the Dishwall guys, we all grew up together um, for the most part in a small town in California called Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were learning our instruments and learning how to play in the 1980s. How old were for you? For the most part. Like, uh, you were kids, like? I, well, Jr. and George were kids. They were 13 when they started playing together. What? And, and it was on and off. You know, they'd gone different directions and, and joined different bands. But those two guys started playing together when they were 13. Um, How old were you when you met George and Jr.? Um, I met Jr. first, actually, because... So Jr. had a studio at his parents' house. Right. N New American recording or something new american and, and so uh the band that i was in at the time was called circus life and it was it was doing fairly well we were recorded at jr's house and he'd stop in there he had an engineer that that was working in the recording there and he would be in and out and stuff and i learned that oh that's jr he's in a band called life talking mm. had a good following uh in santa barbara but primarily playing covers like 80s-ish covers in excess, right. Simple Minds, New Order, that kind of stuff. And um, which was like all the music I loved. <laughs> but Jer's a few years older, and um, I don't know, he kind of rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> it seemed kind of like arrogant or something. So I, it, it was just kind of a funny dynamic for a few years till I got to know him uh, later on when, when they asked me to. The way it happened was... I might be getting off topic, but no, 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 the, no, no. The, the band was called Life Talking, right? right? All through the '80s up until about 1992, it was still Life Talking, and it it had originals, and they put a CD out, and uh, it was, did fairly well. It sounded amazing, but it was just a little bit dated. It just sounded a little bit like one song sounds a lot like right. Simply Red, and. Um, it, it, it was really well recorded though and so anyway they had some management that was interested and they suggested why don't you get a bass player because at that time it was all sequenced mm. okay so there was like george was playing live drums right but they, he was playing to a sequencer exactly it was sequenced bass and and so um they suggested you get a live bass player they hired me for a couple shows they were paying me like a hundred bucks a gig or something, which was pretty good for why not? At, at that point for me. So I was like, okay, yeah, why not? And then their, um, their sound guy manager <laughs> at that point came to me about two shows in is like, look, um, we can't afford to keep playing paying you a hundred bucks per show. Will you join the band <laughs> so we can pay you less? You know, you know, <laughs> that's what, like, that's what people don't understand. Right. Um, I was just talking to Mike a while ago, mm -hmm. literally a while ago, and shout out to the sixth man because Mike's in a band yes. called New Day in August, right? And he's been hanging out with a guy called Ryan. Mm -hmm. And I go, Ryan's your sixth man. But then again, 
proposed to him to make him part of the band. Yeah. He invests his time and everything else, but everything gets divided by six. Yeah, absolutely. So divide zero by six, divide a hundred dollars by six, but you don't pay him per show. Right. Yeah. And and it just it 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 speaks more to the like you've got to you got to be a unified front. Mm. You've got to be all mm-hmm. with the same drive same and, and, and the same goal. Yeah. And at that age. That's one thing we that band had going for it. You know, I I'd had some other projects and was, I felt like we're doing well and we're starting to get some indie label interest in right. Los Angeles and stuff. And it, it could have taken a different path, but I felt that with Rodney on guitar and JR being really good looking and, you know, the, the caliber of songs that they had, even though it was dated, that it, it just, there was a lot of potential there. And, so you saw that. And I was already close with George. Right. And, right. And so um, so that relationship already made sense. So I, I agreed to join. But when I joined, I, sh- I shouldn't talk about it, but I'll talk about it anyway. But I, I had heard that, see, there's a band from Santa Barbara called Toad the Wet Sprocket. Yeah. And I really looked up to these guys when I was younger. And um, they're only a f- few years older like glenn phillips the singer Mm -hmm. was a junior at san marcus high school when i was a freshman okay and so when he was a junior in high school that his band got signed and they were they were gone on the road 90s they were like exploded and that columbia records bought out and bought those first two records that they had released independently on their own and um re-released them uh before uh uh, Fear came out, which had All I Want on right. it and stuff, right? Um, so anyway, it's just, it's just like, oh, this is possible. This is like the only thing I love, the only thing I'm good at. And Toad did this, so this must be feasible Lucrative, thing to do. You know, yeah. Because you're young and you're so dumb, you don't know that everything that is against you in the process. Right. You just go for it, you know? And uh, so at any rate, I kind of... I put everything I, I had into music. I left high school a year early. Um, I had a lot of difficulty in high school. Was actually asked to live, leave my freshman year. So I got kicked out of high school my freshman year. The fir- that's the first year of high school when you're in the United States. So, um, so yeah, I had a rough time. And I was having a hard, hard time getting caught back up. So Damn. I ended up just... L- I ended up leaving high school and testing into City College. Right. So that I could take music so classes. The GED. Yes, like mm-hmm. a GED. Um, it's a proficiency exam. So right. so that they would let me in so that I could just take music classes and uh, in general ed too, but I could take uh, jazz improvisation and right. music theory. And Did you excel string, when you took? A string ensemble. Uh, um, the jazz improv class, I absolutely loved. I <clears> absolutely <throat> loved it. And there were several other musicians that ended up Getting in signed bands from that same program you know I was in. I'm going to jump ahead. No? Yeah. And um, weird question, but Hayes. Oh, yeah. The bass. Yeah. How? I don't know. You know, that's one of the early songs that we wrote. And at that point, what happened was ESPN um, had reached out to us through our, our manager, who was like our bro. He's just the same age as us. It's like. You know, but he did work in Los Angeles and knew some people. So we get asked by ESPN to do some instrumental jams. Mm. And um, so we laid a bunch of stuff down as organized as we could on like a dat tape or something. Right. Oh, sent, that. sent it down to LA. <laughs> right. You know, some old school digital format and uh, sent it back down to him. But pieces of that were the verses of what became Hayes. Right. Same thing with Moisture also uh-huh. came out of that ESPN just jamming. And that a lot of our songs at that point came through just just playing together and Jr. reaching into um, a lyric books that he had that were kind of like pre sketched out, um, you know, ideas. Some more um, organized than others, yeah. you know. But I think Hayes was an example of one that he just pretty much opened up his lyric book and started to bringing those words into uh, adding a melody to it and it just working it in. And the, it was very much like counting the cars and Hayes and 
a few of those tracks on that record were really just like <laughs> everybody just mm -hmm. putting in their thing yeah. and it coming together. You but, know? And, but this is what impressed me about you. It's when you look at the chords, like counting blue cards, simple chords. Yeah. But then again, the articulation of the arrangement, the placements of notes, I'm visualizing it in my head. Yeah. How you and George just. You're pick a up. drummer and you can visualize this. Yes. I'm also, yeah. <laughs> I know, I love that. That's awesome, man. <laughs> right? You know, I know, right? Like how many people are in Dishwaller, right? Three musicians and a drummer. But. <laughs> No, Shout out to George. Yeah, anyway. That's right. No, George does his stuff too. <laughs> but it's a rare it's rare that, you know, I think that drummers know that stuff too. But yeah, you know, there it was it was a time of like just trying to do something different, you know? Mm -hmm. That's all it was. And we didn't necessarily fit in completely in the landscape of the music industry at that point in time exactly right. Like it wasn't a grunge thing or like Green Day or you know, or Pearl Jam or Alice in Chains or we were just sort of this weird, we were from a, a very different kind of area, different kind of musical upbringing, and, and it was a more melodic type of thing. I was just, I was raised on the Beatles and, and melodic rock and songwriters, you know, because I was raised by a single mom in the 1970s, and so it was just a lot of singer-songwriters and James Taylor and yeah. Lee Scalar bass lines and yes. stuff where it's, you know, you're, you can walk in, in and out of the chords heard and, you and connecting them heard, together yeah. and stuff and that's mm. really what haze is you know? yes kind of like a yes oh my god but just just so that if george is watching remember counting counting blue cars you know at that specific part after the first chorus going into the second verse where you just guy where you just sustain on on b yeah right right and then Right. Ah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Tasty. Yeah. That that whole thing. I just I you know. How, I, was it was it by accident or was that plan? Hey, I'm gonna I'm just gonna stay on B because the chord the, the verse is gonna start on B, but I'll just stay there and you do something. I don't know, but when I heard that song for the first time, I'm like, ah, they landed on the one. Okay, let's see where this is gonna go. Right. And then I heard the drum, the drums go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That I mean. Do you remember how how that? I re piece? I remember the day. I remember the day in the studio, our little rehearsal spot that we had. That was an old plumbing, a plumber's place or something in Santa Barbara. That you know, it was just a cinder block room, no larger than this, and. You know, uh, that one, uh, George will say, oh, yeah, you never would have come up with that. And he <laughs> said that to me. But in all honesty, there was a lot of communication. Mm. There was a lot of words. There was some communication between us on that drum part and stuff. And he has also said to me, "It's bi I wouldn't have played it like th that. Really? You know, like, that's busier than I would have wanted to do. I would have laid into it right, more or something. Right. He, he has said things like that over the years, too, that... He wouldn't have necessarily approached it that way, but you know, it's but it, it it's very much it, hundred percent him. That displacing the beat like that right there and stuff is just like that's just what what he does. Which is why which is why when I hear somebody cover Counting Blue Cars, I'm always looking at that part. I am too. If that person doesn't nail it's it the way it's quite right either is. And the drum beat in, in general, I mean, and it's okay for, for cover bands to approach things the mm -hmm. way that they want to. You got to play what feels natural to yeah. you. But, but nine times out of the 10, out of 10, the drummer is not approaching that groove the same way. Right. And a lot of times the, the guitar player, you know, the relationship between the guitar and the bass is weird on that song too, where the bass Da, 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 and then you go, yeah. Yeah, well, the bass is descending mm -hmm. and, and the guitar uh, line is actually is ascending ascending so like a I, like a drone kind of yes there's there's a drone to it as well but i'm playing g over yes. where the guitar is yes. playing d yes. and so it creates this weird fifth yes. tension that's right there and what rodney and i were trying to do was again we were just kids trying to emulate another another band we were trying to learn another song by a band called catherine wheel okay. from, from england and 
they had a song called Crank that was on the on the on the <laughs> you know that Michael yeah. and, and um so that song is on on the Chrome album and we just we had heard it on the radio and we're trying to kind of like figure out how right. they were making that sound and we just found our own chord progression and then yeah. and then JR again opened up his lyric books to something that was called God it wasn't called Counting Bukars it just says God in his lyric book it's just working title and just started feeling his way through it, ham and eggsing it, as we used to call yeah, it. Yeah, 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 just, just putting placeholder lyrics. Yeah, and just placeholder lyrics, mm -hmm. you know, where they need to be and, and getting us through it. But, you know, that's another great example of, like, when the band was really firing on all cylinders. Like, everybody's just, like, contributing something to the... Now, when you guys made um, the first album, mm -hmm. you guys were not signed. Yeah, we were. You were signed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so... It's funny because, you know, in the 90s, like, it became this lame thing that if you were an alternative act, if you were a new rock act, you had to come from this credibility. You had to have previously released indie, indie released mm. records, uh, a grassroots following in place. And this was the early stages of Live Nations 360. And, and <laughs> we didn't have we didn't have any of that. We didn't. Like, tell the West Brocket, they had 50,000 names on their uh, email right. list. And, you know, they, they had sold thousands of records on their own independently. We were basically around as Dish slash Dishwalla, because we threw the Walla on there, 18 months before we got a deal. So it wasn't some really, you know, there was the decade before that of hard work, but Dishwalla itself really was around a short time but we were just focused and that that's the big that's thing the that word, no? i'd say to any young artists that are out there listening is that it just takes everybody on the same page focused get off work every day go to band practice yeah and just get that thing so rock solid that yes. it's undeniable and the songs reworked and reworked we re-recorded re the demos three times same songs you know, it wasn't until the third time around doing some of these songs that, that, and we weeded them out too. We had other songs that we dropped along the way um, after getting some direction from other people. But we did have good people giving us direction along the way too. And uh, we had this early guy, when I first joined, I came into the situation. There's this guy coming up from Los Angeles every weekend to work with the band. Was he the one? He was not one of the producers. No. No. Okay. So this guy, check <clears> this <throat> out. The song "My Sharona." Yeah. By the Knack. By the Knack. Okay. So this guy Scott Anderson had worked with the Knack, and knew how, what they went through to make that band so tight and so undeniable on stage, and and that's why they signed such a big deal. It, it was a huge deal when they when that band got signed. It was like a million dollar deal in '79 or whatever. You know, you know that you know that so like, that thing with the Knack. How do you get to Madison Garden? Mm practice <laughs> <laughs> they were like they're, excuse like, me uh, yes how do you get to madison garden <laughs> practice <laughs> yeah so my he, oh my god so this guy was coming up there and you know and he he sort of just rubbed me the wrong way a little bit you know and it, you could tell he was living off his the knack money from uh -huh. 10 years prior wow. and stuff and hadn't really done in between it was a little huh. bit disconnected from what was cool and what was happening on radio at the time anyway it turned out that he was going to take like 50 percent of everything every guys everything if he, if we continued on with him so we we had around the same time met another guy named ken jordan okay and ken jordan was just a sweet harvard guy that had uh, a development deal on virgin for his act which didn't have a name at the time but it ends up becoming the crystal method <laughs> It had a hit song called Get Busy Child yeah. and electronic music. And so um, Ken was like, you need to get a, get out of there and we'll re-record your demos down at my place in L.A. So you guys come on down. And so we come on down and Ken produces our demos down there and they sound amazing. And it gets us to a certain point. And, uh, it, you know, we, when it, we did the rotation, sent them out, nothing's happening. Well, we hear about this contest back in the... In through the 80s and 90s, Yamaha had a worldwide Battle of the Bands contest called Soundcheck. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. 
and sound check was coming through and it was just the timing was like do we want to do this guys i mean it's kind of lame but let's just do it and see see what happens so we agree to do it we ended up winning the first round the southern california round of it and what we won was studio time cool. at at cello which is like a huge beautiful recording studio in, in LA. la so we redid the songs again with ken and those those demos are what ended up getting us a deal. So it did work out, you know, and we, we, we did like another round. We lost to some blues band from Portland. Wow. You know, but um, I'm friends with these guys in the Verve Pipe. Yeah. Um, from, from, yeah, yeah, the freshman, yeah. Well, uh, the Verve Pipe won all of Soundcheck. <laughs> they won the worldwide. Yeah, and they won a record deal and made the record, and I think got dropped right after it didn't do well. So it was years later that they got signed again. But uh, so anyway, that, that was kind of how the process worked. But we just were, we were all a unified front, focused. I've never seen another band that worked as hard as us since. I've still never seen a band that's that, like, determined. Right. You know? Now, and that's why it was such a short period of time. <clears throat> when th this whole focus thing, right? Because the journey of a band, people don't know, is... is in your case, times four in terms of being married to a person, you're married to three people, mm. three other people, and this is a commitment and the, the direction has to go a certain way. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't work. Yeah. How did you deal with decision makings? Like, like when you said uh, we had to weed out some, some songs and all that or working with this guy who worked for the NACA, we, we got to cut him loose. Yeah. Who makes the decisions? Who agrees? What if it's a deadlock two and two? Mm -hmm. Who splits the deadlock and all that stuff? Well, fortunately, we had people that we trusted on our team. Okay. So, you know, we, you had, we had Dave Young, who was our manager that worked for MCA, and he was our age. And uh, he just had our backs and, and had our best interest, and so we, we put our trust in him. You know, but the manager thing is a hard decision to make because like there's a lot of sketchy guys. Yes. Out there. And my take on it is you should never have a manager unless they can add to what you're already right. capable of doing. They have to be able to bring something to the table. Like that, level up, right? That you're yeah. unable to do mm -hmm. for yourself. So that's the only reason why you should go to management, you know. But um, we we just we we got some really, really solid direction and and you're absolutely right, man. It's um, there. I'm sure there were tense times, but for the most part, during that era, we were just pretty unified, and we'd all sac. The other thing is sacrifice. Right. Sacrifice. You know, it's like social life. No, nah. I was the, I was the only person married at the time. I'm the youngest guy in the band, the only one married, the only one with a kid. How you old know? were you when you got married? Twenty. Okay, I want to talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about that when we come back after this break. <laughs> okay. And we are back with Dish Wallace, Scott Alexander. Oh my God. So, 20, with a kid, married, about to rule the world. <laughs> huh? I wasn't so sure about that at that point. Yeah, but you, know? you guys were focused. I mean, every band. Yeah. The the goal is, you know, we will dominate. But yeah. how do you go? That's what we said too. We we called ourselves the new new rock army, right? New rock army, and you know we. Uh, yeah, I would. Here's the thing: the the other guys in the band were are smart guys, right? And um, they could have done other things. You know, Rodney was working for a cancer research firm in Carpinteria and so he was in the healthcare industry yeah yeah Security. and he was smart and NJR smart and George is smart uh and Greg the keyboard player the original keyboard player guy you know he was working at Raytheon you know he, wow he was smart guys but I wait why why are you so why are you being so self-deprecating well that? I I just knew play the bass mm. I just knew how to play the bass but maybe that was good <laughs> right because you were the you were the what um I guess the benchmark of what focus is. Yeah. Well, it had to be. I had to be. Like, what else am I going to do to support this little family that you, I've you know, embarked you on? Know what, you I've know what? created this thing, and now how am I going to find my way out? 
You know what, Scott? Before I ask you more questions about this backstory of the family and, and the context of who you are, I just want to tell you that with, with my band, Intro Voice, I'm the youngest. Everyone went to college. I, I purposely dropped out of college mm-hmm. and my mom goes, so I guess you got to be good at playing the drums because this is the only thing that will feed you. Right. Because I really purposely got myself kicked out of college mm-hmm. so I don't go back to school anymore. Wow. How cool that your mom was able to say that to you, though. You right. Know, and have that support. And I, I think my my mom, you know, because it was just me and her growing yeah. up, a single mom, and uh, and I'm an only child. So it was just like, you know. Well, was I, you was know, your mom I, disappointed when you got yourself kicked out of Oh, freshman, yeah. Of but, you know, that was just sort of the tip of the iceberg. I, I had gotten you know, arrested at a young age. And, and then I just found myself on probation, you know, like when you, through basically throughout my teens, I was in some form of trouble. Okay. And I, you know, the rest of the guys were not like that. They were, they were, they were better kids than I was. Now, so you were in all sorts of trouble. You had a girlfriend. Yes. Did you marry your girlfriend? Yes. I, she, we were just inseparable. I mean, like best friends at, for years at that point. I, I knew it was all going to work out if we stuck together. And so in March, 30 years. 30 oh. years. <laughs> What's your wife's name? Shelly. Congratulations, Shelly. Yeah. I'm, you know, crazy. while I'm looking at you and I am... I am just in awe and I am inspired because what, what, again, again, I'm looking at you and I see essence preceding existence. Like it's all in your head first. Right. It has to be. Right? Like, like every step you took, whether it was getting in trouble or yep. knocking up Shelly or tying the knot and spending 30 years. This was all in your head, manifested, and just moving forward. Yeah. Even playing the bass. And even was, playing the bass, the success, the imagining yourself on yeah. stage, the imagining yourself yes. win, win, winning the Billboard Award, the imagining yourself. It's, it's, all, visu- <gasps> it's all visualization first. No this chance, not, yeah. It's, it's um, like, uh, and it's hard when, when people are in a rough spot to, to, but you con- were. to convey that to pe- someone that's in a rough place, but I was, I swear. It's so like, that, this is the, that, now that we're talking. So this is, you were in a rough, like, like to be, to be able to fo- focus on the music, on a band without a future, um, with a career that, uh, that, I mean, this is California where most bass players and drummers and everybody mm-hmm. is, yeah. right? The melting pot of talent. Here you are telling your pregnant wife <laughs> we're going to make it. <laughs> right. Putting your faith in three other people, four at the time. Yeah. How? Yeah. How? Well, I mean, let's, let's talk about you. Well, huh? it's not like it was just like it was solid all the way through and it was like this is what we're gonna do there were challenges right there were doubts there was hiccups there was doubts there was a point where i was gonna quit Mm. and i and they were were looking for other bass players there was a point right before and what happened was uh you know i think soraya was born and you know we're living in my in-laws house and i'm just like guys i gotta go back to school i gotta figure this college thing out i gotta figure out something this is not this has been a year over a year and I don't know that this is going to happen. So I said, once I said that, the week, like days following that, we got an, we get an offer from Hollywood yes. Records, which is like, they had just had some success with Sublime. Right. It was a small uh, indie, uh, yeah. well, it was not an indie label, but it was owned by MCA, mm-hmm. which is a real sketchy company that you didn't want to be a part of. Our, our, we knew that because our manager worked there. But it was enough to be like, all right, Shelly, maybe we ought to hang in there another six months. And so we did that, and we worked really hard. We played L.A. a bunch, and we, we, we chartered buses of our fans from Santa Barbara down to Los Angeles to pack the clubs, right. to make them look full. Yeah. And um, we, we, we rallied A&R guys from the companies to come on out and check us out, and, 
and we rallied the right guy. Uh, this guy, Mark Mazzetti from A&M Records, came down and was just, just I, I mean, really, a lot of it was JR, but he loved the songs. And it was really, Charlie Brown's parents was really the, the because he was a huge Queen fan. Oh. You know, and, and so uh, at any rate, uh, it, it, finally, uh, it finally panned out. But there was some sketchy times there where it was almost going to, and then Heavenly Father was just like, no, yes. I'm going to, you're getting, ah. you're, you're, you're getting off track. I just need to throw your car right back on the track again. You but know? you know what? Here, like what, when when you were getting paid a hundred dollars to play with Jr. and George. Yeah. How old were you then? Uh, I guess nine, nineteen or twenty. Okay. So Nin- see, so that's right around. Right. Yeah, so that was that was like when you were getting paid a hundred dollars. Yeah. You were like, <laughs> yes, Shelly. <laughs> This right. is it. it We're making money. Tangible, yeah. Right? And then a crossroad game. Yeah. Where you can't pay you a hundred bucks anymore. You in, you out. Right. What was going through your head? Uh, I mean, that was a challenging time because right. I was also playing in, I think, two other bands at that point. So when oh. I joined, joined, when I had to join the band, it meant that I needed to say goodbye yes. to these other projects. It just wasn't going to work. Yes. I was trying to make it all work for a little bit there, and I was just ended oh. up pissing everybody off. It was, nobody's happy when you spread yourself too thin, right. you know. Um, so no, that was a hard thing to do. But you know, one thing I say is like all the. I know there's a lot of uh, cover bands in the Philippines. Yeah, and it's that's a hard thing because that's like a little bit of like the the carrot, you know, is like yep. you're making money when you're playing covers. And you have to give that up to play originals. And, and it's like, you got to make sure those originals are solid enough and, and people are into it enough to justify breaking away from the cover thing. So I remember being a little conscious of all that and looking at the guys in my community that were like in their 40s. Ooh, like so old in their 40s. I'm like 50 now. <laughs> you know, but, but my perception of like, I never want to be in my 40s playing covers. Oh man, never want to do that. Here I am, you know, 49. I'm a, I've been a working musician like for maybe the last decade since things yes, kind of yes, slowed down with yes. touring for Dishwalla. I've really have done everything. I'm in a U2 tribute at band based out of Calgary. You know, I I I do a lot of different things musically and playing with different singer-songwriters right. and covers and everything. I just do everything. You know, and that makes sense for me now, but at that point when you need to be focused, when you're in your prime. Right? A sacrifice, you right? You gotta sacrifice. It's just, it just is what it is. Now, when, when you let go of everything, and then there's the whole, okay guys, I am putting my, my, basically me and my family's future in your hands. You guys cannot play around. Yeah. Did you guys have a conversation? Were they cognitive about the fact that you had responsibilities and they were kind of responsible with and for you. Yeah. I, yeah. So uh, I think the way the conversation, went, <laughs> we were all together one day and, and uh, it, it came, you know, it was really, it was Rodney that kind of chimed in and everybody like almost seemed to make a vote whether I was going to join the band or not, because it, it meant that, JR was going to have to like give up a little bit of control maybe, or a little bit of money potentially to have another member in there. But um, Rodney is just like, he's already a member as far as I'm concerned. And, mm-hmm. and George I knew was already good because he brought me into there mm-hmm. in the first place and Greg was cool with it. So JR was like, all right, I guess I'm cool. <laughs> 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 but the, the conditions that I put on the band, this goes back to where I got derailed from my yes. first conversation was, the conditions that I put on the band was that we'd split everything evenly. Mm. And so, because I'd heard of these, the situation with Toad the Wet Sprocket where there was two primary songwriters, Uh. Glenn Phillips and Todd. uh, Yeah. And Todd. Uh, So they were doing well financially. And we, there you look at the rhythm section living with their parents, number one song in the country and the rhythm section is living with their parents. And so this, not you know, cool, yeah. The the imbalance yes. financially because of the songwriting royalties going to two main songwriters was not going to work for me. And Polychrome, the band that I was in simultaneously, that was going to be the case. It was a British guy that wrote all the songs, brilliant player and songwriter. And uh, but 
he was going to take all the publishing. And I was like, Ooh. oh, this is not going to work. No. I don't think. Like, I don't know much about the music industry, but I think I'm going to make <laughs> no money. <laughs> So this is just not going to work with my family. So here's the deal, guys. We need to split everything evenly. And I need you to be respectful of my beliefs and my family and, and everything. And, and they're like, we're good. We're all good. And, and we, for however, till 2005, we were all good. Everything Communication was, is the key. It is the key. That's all it was, was just laying it out. Now, later on, it became problematic for certain members of the band. Wish, Why? Wish they didn't give that up. But it kept us together for over a decade right. because we we were doing we were doing the same just as well as each other. It was all even. And later on, I learned that Radiohead, REM, maybe even Pearl. No, not not Pearl Jam. Um, Queen, Queen, split their publishing. You too yeah. splits their publishing evenly. Evenly, all those bands are like even. Mm -hmm. And so, I thought that was so amazing you know, that. The biggest bands in the world, REM and U2, splitting everything evenly. So if that says anything, I think that's... Like, like JJ and I were just having a conversation because we're the chief songwriters of Intro Voice. And we were like, you know what? If Even if we wrote the songs, but there were th five guys hanging out in the studio and five guys playing all these songs, yeah. we, we got to split everything five ways. Yeah. If you want them to stay a part of your band long term, yeah. uh, you do. Right. But if you don't care, you don't care. You know, there's bands exactly. like, you know, I, I I was obsessed with the Smiths when I was younger, and 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 Johnny Marr and and Morrissey, of right. course, are the two primary songwriters, and they just they felt that their rhythm section was just disposable. Like they they'd be fine without them. They get a couple different players, and they were had no idea how complex those right. bass parts were and how unique they were yes. to the music. Yeah. They but right? you know some. I, but because that's the singer, you know, he just wasn't cognizant to what was involved and what was actually going on to propel those songs and make them popular. I've always felt the same thing about Led Zeppelin, you know, it was like John Paul Jones and, 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 mm -hmm. and John Bonham, like seriously mm. not earning what those guys are earning. Like that is one unit, like everybody contributing the equal, yes. equal amount of, of any band I've ever heard is Led Zeppelin. So um, it's just wrong when it goes like that. But you know but early but it's good right early on you had the it conversation is it is. Yeah, yeah it is what it is and all that now now money starts coming in yeah life becomes better mm -hmm. how did it affect personalities and egos um i'd say for a good decade we were fine everything everything hung in there pretty well um you guys even had songs it, in smallville it became problematic when the money was drying up in our accounts I, th oh. I think you know because um you know when we we signed a record deal and when it wasn't a large advance by even the standards of that time it was pretty good and our our first record budget was a quarter of a million dollars that was good you know it was good but when we signed when Here's a here's a story for you. We'd heard horror stories of bands selling their publishing. That's the ownership of your songs yeah. too early. And an example would be like, like Pearl Jam. Eddie Vedder had sold his share of the songs early on for about ten thousand dollars or so, maybe ten or twenty thousand dollars. And the rest of the guys were doing really well financially, and he was having to play catch up because of he course. Didn't, he was he didn't have all that publishing money come in. Um, we toured with a band called the Google Dolls. Yeah. And Google Dolls, they were indebted to their previous record label, Metal Blade, to, for fifty percent of all their earnings. Everything, even yeah. the live shows. So they had the, a name is already a hit huge right. single, and they're they're maybe on the follow up record to Boy Named Goo at that point, but. At any rate, they had done really well, and they were still touring in a van and still trying to save money and still not, not really doing well financially because they had sold their publishing early on. Willie Nelson had sold the publishing rights to Crazy, for like Patsy Klein, for 250 bucks, you know, but he, could, he was able to pay rent that month, so he was able to continue on, you know, was his way of looking at it. But so when we, so we're like, we're, we're hanging in there. We're going to hold... Yeah, hold our chips, you know, and as long as we can. And so once County Boat Cars was Blue Cars was number one at Rock, number one at Hot AC, 
number one at AAA, number one at Alternative. It was, you know, top 10 CHR right. on the pop charts. Um, it was, you know, it was a massive, massive success. Then we decided to, to push the button and our manager went, went to see if there was interest from the publishing companies. So Warner Chapel came to the table with like 1.6 million. To buy the, to the publishing yeah. rights. Uh, or no, it was like 1.2 million or something. Mm-hmm. And I was like, dang, I don't know. Maybe we ought to take that. You guys, that's like, <laughs> that's like a, a lot of money. And uh, it was good for even back then. We hung in there. We ended up getting $2.6 million See? from EMI. And so that's what kept us living. Now, I can remember Shelly asking me <laughs> in about 1998 or nine, you know, a few years after Kenny Bacars, Scott, what happens when this money's all gone? Oh, what happens when it's all gone? What's up? What do we do then? And I was like, we just sign another deal. That was my response. We just sign another. This is how it is now. We're going to sign another record deal once these records are fulfilled. We'll sign another publishing deal once this is recouped. This is our life now. This is just what. And there. So my plan was not even a plan and it wasn't even based in any kind of reality because that's like a 25 year old reality. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And, and to people who don't know, people think an advance is a is a is a is a talent fee. No, it's an advance. It's an advance. It has to get like if they back, give you yeah. quarter of a million dollars, mm-hmm. a company has to make a quarter of a million dollars and a penny. Yeah, and then you're fulfilled. Right. Yeah. So, so EMI did end up getting recouped. So it made right. all that money back, which is pretty cool. So. So that was a conversation, and then what? Well. Um. So 2005 comes along. Yeah, 2000. Well, I'd say more like about <laughs> before sorry, that. My my frustrations with things maybe started a bit earlier than that. I think about the time of Opaline. Well, with Opaline, that's that's when you guys really. Um, We'd been through a lot at that point, though, because yes, the, you know we we put so much. I I mean I put so much work and love into the follow up to our first record. Sophomore albums are sophomore always, album. it's always, uh, you yeah. know, because the it pressure is a lot right of there. pressure. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> what happened was, you know, we, it, it was a, a sort of a long process getting the songs written to a point that the record label was happy to sign off on it. And um, we get this thing done. The record label is pretty happy with it. And we get word that right around what's supposed to be our release date, which I think is like, maybe it was in the summer of 98, Okay. Um, I'd have to look on Wikipedia to see where, where that was, but <laughs> it, it, we got word that the, the record label was being bought out. A&M, Polygram, it was all being sold to Universal, Universal. Vivendi, yeah. Vivendi. And so um, here's what's going to happen. We're going to drop over 100 bands. Don't worry, we're going to keep you, but um, we're only going to keep Sheryl Crow, Blues Traveler, Sting, Amy Grant. No, maybe Amy got dropped. Uh, uh, Dishwalla, Gin Blossoms got another record. Mm. But at, at any rate, the, the story was like, and I was like, maybe we ought to wait to put the record. They're like, no, the record might not come out if you if you wait. We need to get the record done and get it out. But your gut feel said. Yeah, and, and what happened was um, they picked a single, which was Once in a While, and um, which I was ecstatic about because i felt like that was like my baby that was my my contribution to the record because i felt that there wasn't really a good lead off single mm. that was in the realm of counting blue cars right, to that, follow that it stood up. out yeah 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 and so um so yeah i just put that that song together and we presented to the band we get that thing done it turned out really good record company likes it as a single we put it out at number one most added first week out and that means like so all the radio stations, they call it ads when yes. a radio station decides to add the song to their playlist. Number one most added first week out. And so we're like, right on. Yes. It's gonna, we're, it, this thing's going to be rocking. And, um, and it just sort of like there was no financial backing to it. And just sort of like. And that's frustrating. It's scary at the same time. Yeah. And that was it. And we hit the road for a little bit in support of the record but you know it's just it was hard it was really hard and it's and it's funny because like in retro what you say no um what was hard about hitting the road hitting the road hitting the road or being away from family or just yes. playing or oh, both oh, both everything but it's hard especially hard when 
that your your baby that you just made here, yeah. this new record that you've slaved over, right, is not doing what you had expected. And <laughs> our situation was like I can remember in retrospect us being the opening band for Blind Melon and for their Soup album, uh -huh. which was their sophomore album, and. I thought it was great record. Uh, there were some tracks I really in Galaxy, which is the single. I really liked the single, and uh, the band was in a bad place on the road. They were miserable on the road, except for Shannon, who was like the <laughs> sweetheart. Like he was the coolest guy in the band. But um, at any rate, I can remember the way that they were on the road, and it was very hard, you know, to be out there supporting this thing that's just dying. It's not doing well. Gin Blossom's second record too. They had like. Um, the, what was on the second what was record? It, yeah, what was that um, single? It did pretty well. How do I find it someplace? As long as it matters. Uh, it said the ball. sophomore album. Follow you down. Follow you down. Okay. Follow you down. But um, it was the same thing. And I can remember getting lectured by, by Robin, the singer, one night, you know, about not being respectful. What? <laughs> yeah, just like... Are you serious, man? It's just funny to think about now. But wait, wait, wait. Was there seniority amongst you guys as well in terms of well, on the headline? It was frustrating because, like, you know, Kenny McCarthy was maybe number one at that point when we were opening for Gin Blossoms on tour. We were doing really well. Well, Gin Blossoms didn't really want us there at all. It was the label forced it. Yeah. And so they already had an opening act that was an Americana artist that they really respected. And they and they said nope, we're not gonna we're not gonna make him play first. He was already on the tour. You're gonna play first if you want to be on the tour. So we're playing to like no people, and uh, we've got the number one song, and and we're just being treated like crap. Politics, and, no? Yeah, exactly. But you know, Robin wanted to to take that opportunity to kind of educate us about how it is, and it was just so weird because we're like we're the same age, dude. We've been doing this the same amount of time as you have. You just your band got bigger. Uh, two years in advance right you know how so, about matchbox 20 were you guys in the same um circuit yes yeah i can remember a night a drunken jr and uh what's his name rob thomas yeah rob thomas at the uh karaoke doing karaoke of their own <laughs> songs at a in a hotel lobby <laughs> and all the girls ah, you're cracking up and stuff you know <laughs> It's funny because we had a show, I think maybe like 2010 with Matchbox 20, and he brought that up. He's like, he still remembered it. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. But, yeah, no, he, he's super cool. But, uh, yeah, those are, they're a good band. Wallflowers, we did a bunch of shows with. And what what happened? Just all the bands. We had to do, we toured with all those bands. What you know? happened um, with regard to the whole 90s explosion? Because mm -hmm. you guys were... Rocket, we were all in the Philippines and we were just basking mm -hmm. it all in. You know, first it was the British invasion in the yeah. 80s and then you guys came out in the 90s. By the way, while you guys were out here banging it, me and JJ were out there in Asia banging it as well and, yeah. and all that. But we would play your songs and um, really get a kick out of everybody just having fun while, yeah. while we did all, all these songs. But what happened? What happened with the whole genre? Uh, you guys got older? We did. And I think that's a huge, that's a really good point. And, you know, our second record came out, takes us into 1999 at yep. this point. And by 1999, it was like, you know, we're without a record. Well, they threw us onto Interscope. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. They put us on Interscope Records, which is like the home of now, Corn, yes. Limp Biscuit, yes, all these new metal acts, and and Dishwalla, and so like alternative radio in the United States just really took a left turn into a heavier sound with seven string guitars and all seven that. string guitar rock exactly yeah. all detuned and and so um, alternative rock prior was really varied mm. you know. The whole surfers and Alanis Morissette yep. and Sarah McLaughlin and, yep. and, 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 you know, like, so it was just like, it was all over the map. It was really diverse. And all of a sudden it all sounded like new metal. It sounded like real heavy and a lot of it alienated 
a lot of people that liked the other stuff and a lot of females, which I never really thought about. But um, the females kind of like didn't have a home at alternative rock anymore yeah. either. So it was like it, it, it. I think what it did was it made pop rock, I, which I consider us to be a little bit lighter so oh. that it fitted it, it fit better on to triple, you know, adult yeah. contemporary. Yeah. Because I think about I, I was recently on a podcast um, called One Hit Thunder, and um, they they let me choose a favorite um, one hit wonder from from the past. And I was thinking about the demographic of that podcast, and I chose um, "She's So High" by Tal Bachman. She's so high, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, which is 1999, but I think that's right at the time of like Coldplay, right? And everything started to get a bit lighter, mm. and. A lot of the bands that we were into, Travis and Coldplay and the British stuff, um, also kind of led us that down that avenue. And that's why Opaline is a is a lot lighter. lighter. It's a but much more of a songwriter type. But you know record. what else do I, I I love it too. I love to listen to it. I don't feel as much connected to it be just because of my, my head space at that time and um, just wasn't as engaged in it, I guess. Wow. Wow. Did you ever feel that? Because, you know, you get desensitized, right? Be um, the formative years, you guys were really focused on making it. Yeah. Normally what happens is when you make it, you tend to lose focus on what got you to where you are. Yeah. Now everything is going downhill and then conflicts begin. What was going through your head at this point when it started coming into the bed? Before you answer that, short break. We'll be back. <laughs> I said you could ask whatever you wanted. I know. You're just not holding back now. <laughs> and we're back. Okay. Ha. Huh ask you anything <laughs> that's what i said <laughs> what happened no holding back yeah so what happened what happened literally focus start you got it in yeah. it's happening i mean the end it's it, the industry is shaking the the millennium is yeah uh, i don't know what and then what happened napster napster i mean every lime everything wire, uh, yeah right? exactly lime wire it, everything shifted and all of a sudden, you know, we, we were on this major label and in a world where I was thinking about today as I'm driving around L.A., I'm like, wow, we had a clothing budget. They used to just give mm. us money for clothes or take us shopping with right, a liaison right. from the label. You know, all this stuff that doesn't exist anymore. And we, we lived in a fantasy. Uh, it was the end of an era. We were a part of the end of that yes. era of all the money from the label. Yes. Where it was a quarter of a million dollar uh, record budgets to start out. And uh, clothing budgets. And what instruments do you think you're going to need? Do you need a new DW Endorse kit? Me, right? oh, not a problem at all. We'll set you up with a DW uh, endorsement guy, and he'll hook you all up with whatever you're going to need. Okay, you're going to pay for it out of the rec record sales. They don't tell you that part, but, you know, it that. Oh, no, it, is it what? Oh, yeah. It was a free? No. What the heck? Yeah. Maybe 10% off or something for the endorsement deal for DW is not. They don't knock it down that way. Paging much. Mr. John Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, so at any rate, you know, 1999, they throw us on Interscope. We ask to be let go out of that deal. We're a million dollars in debt to A&M from the... From the endorsements. From the, from the, yeah, so-called endorsements. From all everything, from the records, the videos. We made like a video for Hayes, County Picard, yeah. Give. Um, somewhere in the middle. Some, well, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's later. That's later, but, um, but still. Oh, this is the first album. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, we made four video. Charlie Brown's parents. We made Charlie four Brown's videos. Parents, yes. Each one of those is right around a hundred grand. So yeah, we 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 get. At, wait, wait. You thought they were free? No. And, you knew and, you were. You guys were paying. Well, the for video it. thing is a is shared expense with the marketing. Okay. And and the band on it, so you don't get build the whole thing on on videos. But at any rate, it was right around that time they said. We're not doing videos for bands anymore, period, unless they have a single taking off at radio. Then we'll quickly make a video. But otherwise, we were, they weren't getting them on MTV or VH1, so what's the point? A um, friend of mine just posted 
Um, MTV is 30 years, uh, 40 years old. MTV is 40 years old today. Thank you for 15 years of music. That's right. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. Okay, go. So, right. so, so in debt, uh, and then... Yeah, so um, so what happened? They, they let us out of the deal. And right around 2000, 2000 or 2001, our original guy that signed us to A&M, Mark Mazzetti, found himself at an independent label called uh, Emergent. And these guys had a bunch of money. And they mm -hmm. wanted to pattern that label off out after another label called Wind Up because they had just hit it big with a band called Creed. Oh, okay. And Wind Up, the Creed scenario was that they spent a million dollars to get Creed into something marketable, the record and the yeah. marketing, and, and get it to make money well. They kept throwing money at it and throwing money at it. It ended up costing $4 million to break Creed. So it was not like our Creed broke organically and people really loved that band. <laughs> it's just that it, it cost a lot of money to make it happen. But, uh, and, and eventually people did love Creed, I'm yeah. sure. But um, so Emergent was kind of modeled after that. It was a new breed of independent label and major distribution. So we did Opaline. Yeah on emergent and so now you were going good indie. budget and we were just happy to be making a great record again with a real producer uh greg wattenberg who had a writing background and a, a publishing deal with emi and he was going to help us with the songs a little bit more and so come at it from a different angle with what a different was the, producer too. what was the social climate inside the band at this point pretty not real good because we had been beating our heads against the wall since 1999 trying to write songs right and we had written plenty of songs, and they just weren't good enough. I'll who's, be honest with you. Who they said they weren't, weren't good enough? We we knew inside ourselves that this is not solid enough. Uh, and by the time we, we reconnected with Mark Mazzetti, right. and he was interested, he said, play me all the stuff you've got so far. And he was like, really, you guys? Like, <laughs> What have you been doing for the last two years? And we'd go to band practice every single day still. We still had that drive. And we'd just sit there in the studio and the gear and just look at each other and fiddle around with stuff, maybe start arguing. It was, it was really bad. It was, a, it was a really rough time from 99, 2001, until things started to lighten up once we got our footing again. Is there a difference going into the studio with no money? And going into the studio now with money. Yeah, right. <laughs> what was what was the difference like? Well, I mean, you guys didn't notice it. Like, well, now I'm asking you the question. Yeah. It makes you think. Oh, yeah, it's not uh, about the money. Yeah, no, but then again, it changes the the drive somehow. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you're in a legit studio and the clock's ticking, you got to deliver and you've got a time frame and it's got to be focused. Right. Now, when we were trying to write songs on our own for those two years in our in our own right studio it was so unfocused you know and ah. and but so jr was you know kind of struggling and we were all just we were just going to band practice for really no reason we should have just taken a break and re reconvened maybe when he had some good song i and things had shifted in the band where we used to like on the first record I saw we'd jam out and we had those espn jams we turned into moisture and and haze <laughs> and 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 Jared opened his lyric Easy, book, yeah. and, and all of a sudden we just have magic. Yes, it just had magic. Yes, and out of nowhere, and a, after we started struggling, and the lyric books was all dried up or something, it was just like it became a, a chore to Ooh. write songs, not an enjoyable kind of jam yes. out thing. And we would do our jams like back in the day, like yeah, just get something going on this man, and. Uh, he couldn't wrap his head around a lot of what we were doing a lot of the time. And so it was easier for him because he, he wasn't a guitar player. Originally, JR is a pianist. pianist. Um, he picks up guitar really to, to fill out the sound live. But he became good enough on guitar to start writing songs. And so, and that was fine by me. It was fine for him to just take an acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and 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 do songs i don't care just as long as we've got songs and they're good songs that's all i care about and uh so um we really struggled until we we met up with greg wattenberg and really focused on the writing and pre pre-production is what it's called 
and we we got a solid set of songs that we could finally go in the studio with but it was a process so now going into the studio you guys yeah. were kind of not tired but you guys were wiped in terms of in terms of our relationship yes. with, with each other. Yes, 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 right? In terms of the music and no, the work that we no. needed to do, we were good. Mm. But internally, we of were course. pretty tired of each other, I think. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. Now, that, that, so that's 2002. Yes. So we make Opaline. It does what it's going to do. It sells about 100,000 units on an independent label. That's great. That's yes. great. And that's a lot of records for, for an independent release. You got so. sync rights on that, too. I mean... Uh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, we got some good sync rights mm. stuff and... Um, um, the DVD version, you know, one of the first bands ever to release in 5.1, you know, with a DVD audio version yeah. of it and stuff. We did some fun stuff. And right. um, so anyway, we, we did this label and uh, I, I, I was, we, oh, I know what happened. The touring for that record was such that the money, the money became more and more an issue. At this point, I've got three kids. Um, I've got three children at that point. And the rest of the band, do they have kids? At I this think point? George has one, maybe, but George, no, George is out still at that point. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Rodney has one. Rod Rodney might have it, has his first son by then. Yeah, so Rodney has one. So fat, okay. So I've got three kids. So cool. I've got the most burden. I've got the most on my shoulders still. And um, I, I said to the guys, um, I. I don't know my, how much longer <laughs> I can keep this going. And I think they kind of brushed it off. Like, sure, you, you're, what else are you going to do? You know, they never verbally said that, but I, I, but at the back of their heads, as time like, progressed, we, you know, we, we toured that record. We did what we could, uh, didn't really make much money. And, um, so we're just struggling, starting to struggle financially. We get to about 2004 and we're writing songs for what's going to be this self-titled album that's yeah. finally on Spotify and stuff, right? And I said to them, before we started recording that record, this is my last record. Why'd you say that? Because I've, I, I've got to move on. Where, 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 where were you going to okay. go? Well, here... I'm just asking. You just ask you? I don't know. Ask you anything? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I had options at that point. There's a family business that uh, my wife's family, blah, blah, blah. So but I, then again, I mean, you were really going to turn your back on, on music. Well, I, I just didn't know what else to do. I was burnt out on it, in yeah, all honesty. Yeah, fair I enough. was burnt out on it. I was burnt out with the guys. And uh, so I said, one more record, and I'm, I'm out. I'm taking off. And they, they brushed me off, said, sure, whatever. We get through making the record, and uh, I'm, I, by, I'm already looking at houses in another state. Like, I'm serious. Because at that point, if you're a musician in 2004, 2005, our mortgage industry in the United States yes. is such that they're they're just giving houses to yes. people. They're this giving the, them the, away. Uh huh. Just state stated income. Stated loans. income. Yes. <laughs> I'm like Shelly, if we want to go get a nice house uh, uh, somewhere, we need to go now. <laughs> so um, we looked around and we looked at Arizona. We looked at Boise, oh, yeah, Idaho. Oh big big houses over there. Yeah, and and it was priced about the Arizona and and Boise in Idaho were priced uh -huh. about the same, and so um, she liked it better up there. I took her to Arizona first, and we we found a neighborhood we liked, and we we decided to build a home and set up shop up there. And that was right around the same time that her cousin's business, which was a, uh, a smoothie chain, kind of like Jamba Juice, yeah, 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 it's a competitor to Jamba <laughs> Juice, and it was just taken off it was like fastest growing smoothie chain in the u.s at that point so we decided to open a kiva juice in boise idaho so i quit the band sold all my gear i'm never gonna play music again it's what you said that's what i said said goodbye to the guys didn't say a word to anyone for a few years wait wait wait. when you said goodbye it was like cut off yeah i had other stuff to do i was uh, Opening a business, building a house, so Scott, having a family. So Scott Alexander does what he does best, which is focus yeah. on what's in front of him. Right. Same template. Yeah, pretty much. I, it's, the, it's the only way it's going to work. It's the only way it's going to I hope people are taking notice. It really is the only way it's going to work. <laughs> Michael and yeah, I... If you've got a bunch of different business yes. ideas and you gotta, you just got to pick one and nail it at that, 
before you move on to something else. That's what Michael and I keep talking about and, and JJ. Make the main thing, keep the main thing, the main thing. Yeah, right. And you can expand it over time once it's solid. Right. You know, but you, you better make sure that's solid first. Otherwise, it's gonna, you're going to take your focus off of it and it's going to start falling apart. Wow. So, I, so anyway, okay. I move so the go, family Akiva. up. I say uh-huh. goodbye to the guys. Um, maybe loosely keep in touch with a couple of them. And, well, um, like which couple of them? No. Do we have a safe word? Do we do we, do we have a safe word? I said for you to ask anything. Jeez. I think I kept in touch with I definitely with Rodney and 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 probably Jim and and George. The George scenario at that point. Yeah, George. I I, I think we're patching things up okay. around them because um, I think because the the dishwalla thing was in the past for both of us. Right. Because he was not there, you weren't there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. George is in California. I'm mm-hmm. up there, and uh, right. Who, who called who? Between you and George. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I want to say I, I probably did, but okay. I, I think in all honesty, we. What here's what happened. Thank here's you. Here's what happened. <laughs> Let's just cut to it. Thank you. <laughs> The band hadn't spoke to each other in a, in a few years, right. and we get offered a show out of the blue. And so uh, I should preface this by saying, if we'd had better management and a little bit of direction through the rough times, that because here's what happens every decade, okay? The, if you're a band in the 70s, once the 80s come around, a lot of them become sort of lame. For yep. a little while, till people get nostalgic and they remember yes. the songs that they loved when they were in high school or college. And then it turns around and all of a sudden they're nailing it. And I can remember in about 2002 doing a show in Cleveland or somewhere, who knows. And we did a show that was like, okay, attended. And we, I looked across the street and it was like poison warrant and mm. Doc and Dawkin doing a show sold out can't right. get in and it's so fun and everybody's like loving it and I'm like oh yeah wow everybody the 80s are back people love it and that was in 2002 and so I didn't put it together that the, the rough time that we were heading into was our decade of of suffering a little bit yes. until people came back around and when things came back around you have like art from Everclear created the Summerland tour you know, he, to capitalize on this 90s yeah, nostalgia. Yeah. And so things started to turn around. A few years later, we get offered a show. I hadn't talked to the guys in a bit. Scott, do you want to do this gig in Wisconsin? It's called Rock Fest. I'm like... Out of the blue. Yeah, out of the blue. I'm like, JR's on board? Are you sure? And I'm like, okay, count me in if everybody's in. And so I'm, all right, I guess I'll learn how to play this uh, stuff, right? But you sold all your gear. Well, yeah, yeah I did. <laughs> uh, I maybe had a base. You know? Okay. But so what, what did Shelly say when she saw you wood shedding again? <laughs> so That's interesting. Well, before we get there, oh, before we get there, we thought JR said yes, and uh, which he did, and then it turned into a hard no from his manager, which was our old manager. Okay. See, I don't so he got a little bit of influence from his wife and from his manager and said, don't do it. You need to differentiate, sorry, he needs to differentiate himself from the 90s, from that band. He's trying to launch a solo career. Okay, all right, so now we've we've already, we've agreed, to, we've signed contracts for the gig at that point. Thinking, we've signed contracts. Thinking JR was yeah. on board. And um, so what happened was we either, we either tell him we can't do it or we ask someone that we think can pull it off real quick. And so... We went to this kid we knew that had a studio in Santa Barbara that we knew we'd rehearsed at his studio before and loosely knew him. But he was basically like the equivalent of like he was he was in high school when Dishwallow was big and we right. were the band from Santa Barbara that he kind of looked up to. So this is like the like Arnel with, Pineda story, you know? Well, yeah, it is. It is. And it's much like me with Toad the Wet Sprocket yeah. going to the same mm-hmm. high school. And yes. he sees us that we went to that same high school. And he's he's an accomplished singer. He could pull it off. And he's like, heck yeah, I'm on board. I'll do it. I'll learn the songs. And, you know, it's like 40 minutes set or something. It's with, it was with uh, Wallflowers right. and, and Matchbox 20. 
and uh, and Tesla. Oh, that was a dream for him. I know, right? <laughs> so, so you got pictures of him and, and the singer from Tesla and stuff at that show. But anyway, that was Justin's first gig. And um, so time passes on. We, we get offered another one. Hey, Justin, you want to do another gig? Okay, sure. And uh, it, and then so, so pretty much Justin was the one off, one off until it became. Yeah, yeah. Until um, we're like, what the word we were getting was that we could do better and and get more full length tours if if we put some points on the board and and did a, right. did a bit more work. So we decided to do a West Coast leg, where we signed on. We 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 did a West Coast full full on tour, and and that worked out great. We had a blast doing it, and we're like, well. If we, we if we on. make a record with him, then that'll even legitimize us even more. And so we did did a record, but well, yeah. But hold on, we're there yeah, yeah. already. I want to know. Yeah. I want to know. You're do you're managing Akiva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you have a, you have three kids, Shelly, a nice house in Boise, and you're back doing yeah, this. Yeah, but I'm not I, I'm I, not I, fully I, back I, in. See it's, that, now it's I'm, on our own terms. I and, know, and, I know. But yeah. then again, uh, what was the conversation like? I'll be back. Oh. It's, it's hard. It's hard. It was hard on her because she's just like, I thought you were done. Exactly. And the reason why I'm asking this is because there are musicians out there and people yeah. out there who have partners yeah. in lives who... Yeah. So I know. And... and, and you were honest, right? Yeah. I you know, you were. She, she had our, has still, you know, she's supportive. She wants me to be happy. But at the same time, it's like, really? Like, do you... You know, you, you already did that. Why do you feel in the, that you need to do it more? You know, it's just like, I don't know. I just love it. And, and now it's more on our own terms. You know, we go out when it works for us, when it works for our careers and our children, our families. We right. go and do some shows, you know. So it's not like it used to be. I feel like I'm trying to convince you. Like I'm trying to convince my wife. <laughs> Yeah, Paco understand. <laughs> He'll let me go on the road and play with the guys. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now you're doing the west, um, the the west side tour. Yeah, yeah. So in this end, you guys are in control. It's better, right? Less stress. Way less stress. We're just having fun at this point. Right. We're just having fun. But then again, uh, residual benefit is you you guys are gaining momentum. Yeah, exactly. And that and that. From there, it just led to, for the following few years, we would kind of do package tours is what they call it. We'd, we'd right. get packaged with other 90s acts and stuff and Vertical Horizon. And I also play uh, temporarily in Marcy Playground. Mm. just had a song called Sex and Candy. Yeah. So, um, so they're, they're kind of, they're my buddies. And, uh, but so, uh, yeah, we. Da, 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 oh, yeah. Da, da. I think it was like what a singer recently did on like American not American Idol. One of the one of the competition shows that just nailed it, like soul for soulful version of it. So cool. But there, a lot of these songs, you know, just have have They're just nice. withstood yeah, the, the, the test, test of time. time. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. The new generation of of kids that are that are digging on this stuff now. It's it's really cool. So yeah, uh, yeah. that part okay. feels good. So now you guys are gaining momentum. JR's not with the band. Justin's in. <laughs> no conversation at all with regard to that. Uh, hey, buddy. Any plans of coming back? Or, um, hey, buddy. We, the doors closed. We got Justin. How, how'd that work? Not even a conversation. You know, even. I, I mean, I'd like to say that we were mature enough to have that conversation in some mm. form. But in all honesty, it just... It just felt like the door was closed. He'd moved on, and and we had moved on, and into a realm of we're just getting along well. It's low stress, and we we dig playing each with each other and hanging out. And in all honesty, between me and you, there's a lot of our contemporaries that don't dig hanging out with each right, other. It's true. a job. Like they get out, support their families. They got to go out with these dudes that they are so sick of their crap mm -hmm. and do not want to do it. But we actually we just so it becomes more of like out. a family outing kind of thing like among right. friends yeah exactly so um like we'll have a, we got this gig on saturday we're gonna get out of there and go barbecue afterwards you know See? And we'll be hanging out you know that's just how we are it's more of a family thing 
Okay. What would you what would you looking back in hindsight? Are you is your wait, I digress. Is your mom still around? No, she passed away maybe three years ago. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. What 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 was her what was her aura mm -hmm. seeing her only son succeed? And why he really wanted I mean, I can't to really imagine. I can't really imagine what it was like, but I just I just know she was super proud. That's that's all I know. And that was one of the coolest things for me for I mean, not for my mom and for my grandma to be able to present a gold record and put it on the wall in the house, you know, and stuff. And it's just like I can remember my grandma saying like, "Scott had it. Why didn't you tell me you were famous?" You know, it's like I've tried to explain this <laughs> stuff, you know, and, like, and it wasn't until she saw me on like the Tonight Show, yeah. you know, with Jay Leno and mm -hmm. stuff. She's like that it sunk in that it was something tangible that that she could be like, oh, the Tonight Show. He's on the Tonight Show. Like, that's crazy, you know. So uh, but yeah, my mom and my grandma are just just my best, my best friends. You know, they just supported me. Yeah, she's just uh, you were their only boy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so. What do you tell your kids? About? About life. Because you followed your dreams. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it, um, it's hard because I have creative kids too. Like my son, he works in advertising right now, but he's video, does okay. video stuff. But his, his first passion is music and music production and writing songs and all that and stuff. So. It's been hard. It's hard because I know how hard the whole oh. the whole run it is. But yeah, they've got my full support and like really? buying them gear and okay. cameras okay. and all this crap. Like they like I was telling you like my studio is much like yeah. yours, you know. They grew up learning logic and in the studio and learning instruments and stuff and you know, they get some direction from me, but they don't really ask for it. You know, I'm there like if they if they want some direction on things, but Really, they just kind of picked the stuff up through osmosis, kind of just the same yeah. thing as I did, you yeah. know, just naturally. But I think having the instruments around the house and having, you know, readily available for exactly, them. and the recording ability available, probably, you know, that's they, what they knew. Th they knew that was that was popular, right? Was famous. My my oldest son definitely Gabe did um, because he'd come to concerts and stuff. Elijah wasn't born until two thousand two. Okay, so it's been a lot less. Shows it's and Soraya, stuff. Gabe. Yeah, Soraya, Elijah. Gabe, Emmeline. The Emmeline. One, oh, okay. The Emmeline, the one that recently got married and uh, stuff. And congratulations. Yeah, so it's pretty exciting. And then Elijah's the youngest. But he's a, was just graduated as a senior. So 30 years, we're, we're empty nesters now. Oh. Empty nesters, I know. It's like, it's crazy. You, he's off to college, and we're just you know, eating dinner so, together. Uh, this is bad. You know it's bad, right? Yeah. Because... Empty nesters, you have four kids out of the house and you're out of the house. Mm -hmm. So who's in the house? <laughs> not good, though. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Woo! <laughs> All right. Now, here's, here's, a, here's what I want to know, Scott. Yeah. With regard to this whole journey, what kept you grounded? And the reason why I'm asking you this question is because this is very humbling and you're setting a precedent for other artists to, I hope they follow because you're helping us. Mm -hmm. You're inspiring us. There are four other people here in the studio. Well, me included. Um, and we're in awe. You drove more than a <laughs> hundred more than a hundred okay, miles. I had, to, uh, I had to be in LA, but you know, regardless, you could have um, gone back. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, this is very humbling, but why, what keeps you grounded? Mm. Because you being here gives no other person any excuse not to be here. Am I making sense? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, and and, and I, thank you. you know, I mean, but, first things first. I mean, in, I, I realize not everybody has a support system like, like I've got to have with Shelly, you know, but... In all honesty, like she is, she's kept me in, in grounded. Check. Yeah. She's kept me in check. She is the one that is really like had high expectations and stuff for a kid that 
was getting in re- arrested and taking stuff and drinking a lot and getting in a lot of trouble. She's the one that kind of pulled me out of this whole thing. Amen. And, and um, you know, her family grew up in this church and I, I, and I kind of like, I noticed something different in their home that I didn't have in my home. Mm. And, um, and so I think through, through faith and her support and prayer, you know, I yeah. somehow managed to navigate it. I've had some rough, rough times. Businesses fail. Um, relationships fall apart along the way. Yes. Things go wrong. But for the most part, I know that ultimately we've, there's a higher purpose to this. Amen. And, uh, and everything's going to be okay if we just press through, you know, and, and, and do our best. So that's really all I've done, you know. It's about the gist of it. <laughs> so, if there was something that you would change in your life, what would it be? If you were going, if you were given a chance to go back and just correct the timeline, what would it be? Oh, I don't know. I I'm just so thankful, you know. Even when you get through hard stuff, you end up becoming thankful for the hard stuff. Isn't that the weirdest thing? Like, yeah. You know, I think about my upbringing and maybe not having a whole lot of money and feeling kind of down about it when I was a little kid, but I'm so thankful for it now. I'm so thankful for that. That's like who I am and the reason why I appreciate things and stuff like, so, um, you got to have those, those trials in order to like appreciate that later on and make you grow as a person. So, I don't, I don't know that I would change a whole heck of a lot. I mean, there, there's, I mean, career decisions. Yeah. You know, maybe opportunities that I missed along the way that I could have taken that maybe would have positioned me a little bit better right now, you know, advice that I'd received, you know, when things were starting to get rough that maybe I could have done this or that, but life wise, I'd say just, you know, push, push through the hard stuff and, uh, get on through to the next thing and until then and now i feel like what's the next hard thing gonna be ah you know but you know what's nice what's nice about about you sharing your journey and what i noticed is i always i always tell my i have a 25 year old son Mm -hmm. and and right now he's he's working for triple a and i i told him relax your he's he's also into music your passion will find its way back to you right just Take Absolutely. Care, take care of what you need to take care of. And then look at you now being at the top of your game, making that crossroad when uh, the first crossroad was when you were 19 with regard to I'm making money. I'm in three bands. I have mm-hmm. to give up two. Hang out with this one. Put all my eggs in this basket. Focus. Right. Boom. Now I have to focus and give back to my wife and my kids. And I have to focus my energy here but then again it's now back to empty nester rock star <laughs> doing what he loves like, it just yeah it's pretty wonderful now is it, it the full circle of the whole thing you know and and you're speaking with yeah. so much humility and gratitude and that's amazing oh. yeah if there's I mean, it, did you play the philippines yes we did play the philippines let me tell you about that. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> okay, so what happened about um, back to about two thousand and six or seven? Um, we claimed the name Dishwalla, our entity, and we we just formed an equal partnership. And so when we um, took possession of the name, we were able to have control of Facebook and Instagram and right. YouTube and all these things, right? So um, around that time, I was really I need to, I know I need to do better about Facebook posting and and (laughs) it's like, we've been so bad on the dishwallow page, but, um, I was able to look at the demographics and we noticed that over half of the people on Facebook were Filipino. And, and, um, so I started to kind of have fun with it and put some posts out there. If we played in the Philippines, where should we play? You know, what, what should the set list be? You know, just, just engagement questions, you know, out there. Um, uh, and so I started reaching out to Ovation and to some of the bigger promoters. And we were just not big enough maybe for some of the larger promoters. But um, we ended up um, 
getting uh, getting a call from uh, a, a, pr- a smaller promoter that um, wanted to host us to play his uh, surf contest in La Union. Yeah. Oh, nice. And um, I know, right? So uh, Sun and Sand Beach. No, yeah. yeah. Sol Arena. Oh, so yeah. um, so um, bingo, ben- Benji um, Manahan. Uh-huh, Benji uh, Manahan, yeah. Yeah, brings us on out there. And uh, so, uh, so we're all set. We're all excited. We get we go through so much to get and there, there. Yeah, it's and a five-hour drive from the airport. Yes, and I was behind the guys because I I, I lost my pass. I got to LAX and no passport, Uh-oh. and so we had to do some rush things. So the guys were ahead of me. They already got out to La Union. They're already partying before, <laughs> you know, I get out there and stuff. So anyway, they got to take me separately, and uh, um, we get out to La Union and. The worst storm I have ever seen, like, oh. <laughs> comes through. Oh. And, and it just got rained out. The stage, everything's soaking wet. And and so um, I just, we went down. I can remember Jim and I going out there on the stage. And we, we there were so many people oh, out man. there to see the show anyway. It was totally rained out. So we just signed stuff. Hundreds of people signing stuff, signing stuff out on the beach. And uh, and we just, we hung out that night. And we, we packed up. And we went. Back, back to our homes. Flew back to the U.S. That Another sixteen-hour flight. Yeah, that was it. So, um, so the the arrangement we made was that we were going to go back. We'll go back, and we'll go back. Bingo. We'll do another show f- for these guys. So, um, they rebooked us at um, Mega Tent Libis. Yes, in the bis. In the bis. Um, so we we, I think it's about a year later. <laughs> Check this out. We get out there, and there's like, a, there is a typhoon on the way. There's a typhoon on the way. I kid you not. I kid you not. They put us up at like Marco Polo or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, in Ross yeah. Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah, a really nice hotel, and we're up there, and <laughs> just, and so Bingo sends like some bro of his that uh, that worked for the Coast Guard, but he had, he had been stationed in San Diego and spoke great English and stuff, and so he was he sent. Um, him to come kind of calm us down and it's <laughs> this is the path and it's gonna go this way it's not gonna come uh-huh. and, and, but we're prepared for whatever <laughs> and, oh my gosh so um but it, it, we, we, it, the time comes we we do play the show it did rain a little bit but it was mellow and uh one of the best shows i mean best attended shows of of us as a headliner that we'd ever had the the reception we had yeah. was so warm and so great Every single song, people singing along. I mean, it was like, it was so awesome. The we singer, absolutely loved it. We, so the, yeah. the, the singer of the of the band who played before you, uh, Nino Mendoza from yeah. the Blue Jean Junkies. Blue Jean Junkies, yeah. He was. I, he was. I keep he in was, touch with Miggy. Uh, Miggy Batute. Yeah, yeah. He was. Um, Nino was here, and he was talking about that gig. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, how cool. Yes. I think. Uh, yeah, Blue Jean Junkies, and maybe Purple Shoes. Mm. And um, what was the other one? I can't remember the name. Oh, man. Wait, you know what Nino was telling us? Do you remember? Uh, you were a, probably asleep. But uh, yeah, yeah. You're probably. <laughs> anyway, uh, the show was amazing. Yeah. And the pictures and everything, it just turned out incredible from it. So what was, the, what was the reaction like when you played in, in, um, in front of a Filipino crowd? Very receptive, no? Oh, yeah. Very receptive. And... Um, it was just so cool. And I, I actually, I went out into the crowd at the end of the show. And uh, I don't know why, but, you know, I went out there and started meeting some people. And, and then the rest of the guys kind of came out and, and realized it was mellow, too. And, and some of the, the fans that I made contact with that night, I still keep in contact. Yes. You know, the, and uh, we just, we absolutely loved the Philippines. We just loved the people, the warmth. Yes. of the people are just so humble and so sweet and we you know and then and then so my daughter decides to go on a mission right, right. Well, yeah <laughs> so where does she get called to on the wait, mission? wait she gets called to go to the philippines or she picked yes the philippines no, oh you cannot get to pick okay. you get of the called. whole world she gets picked she gets sent to uh to the island of cebu oh and so she am a line this little white kid from Meridian, <laughs> Idaho, is somehow fluent in Visaya. Yeah, the Visayas, yeah. 
And um, so she served this mission <laughs> for 18 months in Cebu, and she went to Lapu Lapu. That's a nice. That's a nice place. And Bohol, yeah, which was beautiful. Yes, the uh, chocolate hills. And yeah, the yeah. chocolate hills. So <laughs> so Emmeline really got to know the culture and love the people for for 18 months working. Was she there. talking to you about it, giving you feedback oh, about yeah. yeah? Yeah. Does she speak Visaya? No. She's fluent in Visaya. She does. Fluent. Oh. Now check this out. She gets home from her mission. She meets a boy, I think online, they meet. And um, <laughs> she's suggested by another friend that lives in Calgary that, <laughs> that had served with her in Cebu. She's like, you're going to talk to this guy. And um, so she ends up hitting it off with this guy online, and they end up really hitting it off. And then they decide to meet and stuff. Well, he's also fluent in Visaya. So, really? Yeah, and they got married. Wow. So I have my daughter and my son-in-law. That if they want to say something privately, yeah, they they're get, speaking yeah. Cebuano to each other. Right. It's like they could, they could they could sell you out, you know, you know. I mean, exactly. Yeah. I'd have no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's just like it the connection to the Philippines for me has just been it, you know, a, a lifelong thing. Cause like my first girlfriend I ever had in Santa Barbara That's Filipino. Barbara Aquino. Oh, and, related and, to the former president though. Exactly. No. Right. I think this is a common name I've discovered. <laughs> yeah. But very prominent, though. Yeah, so she dumped me. And that was the only time I've ever been, like, dumped by a girl was, was from Barbara. But we, we still keep in touch, and it's kind of fun. But uh, her family, you know, was straight up Filipino in Santa Barbara and just so sweet to me. Um, and, you know, over the years, it's just like it, the Filipinos just keep coming into my life for some reason. And then, and then you, right. And then you bumped into Michael. Yeah. <laughs> you bumped into Michael in Pasadena. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know what? I mean, it's amazing. nothing by chance, no? No. Everything by design. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's amazing. The, the world we live in is just one, one world. And it, with me, I'm fortunate that it's music that connects oh, yes. me with, with people around yes. the world. And yes. Even if it's a country that sort of like does, dislikes the U.S. or something, if you're a rock star, it's like it's okay. okay you're gonna get a pass though. Anyway, we'll love you anyway. Now, an album. Mm -hmm. What what's the what's the band's plan with regard to? Are have you guys talked about? Are we are we going to level up now? Are we going to make this our business? We call the shots because Radiohead releases albums on their own volition, right? Yeah, like. Like when you guys um, paradigm shift now it's I create an album I release it right have you guys talked about it that way yeah well we did one record with Justin in 2014 which was a um, like a Kickstarter campaign yeah. kind of thing and uh, it did quite well you know it it paid for itself and made a little bit of money and stuff it was great to do it and it was great for you know having it up on Spotify and getting yes. some licensing licensing stuff we signed a new publishing deal as a result of that. So we went to New York and, uh -huh. and signed a new publishing deal, which was exciting. Um, so yeah, we plan on more music. In fact, either tomorrow or Friday, I'll be recording with the guys, but I think we want to just do singles for a bit. Why? Not? Um, so we want to uh, put more focus into just, just doing singles than, than a whole record. And it's just, uh, in it, it, the, the landscape has changed so much in the way things need to be released. Like I know um, on Spotify has changed the game. And, you know, I look at like John Mayer's new art record, like the single, the first single on it was released three years ago, like 2017. You know, it's crazy. Yep. And you perform that on Kimmel and stuff like 2017. Yes. And that's on the new record that just came out uh, last week. And, so it's they're doing these waterfall releases and they they take that single down and they re-release it with the same irc code there's a lot of tricky stuff that goes into releasing a record now and it's like it's complicated but spotify is much like youtube or anything where they just want content content you want new yeah. record new record mm -hmm. new record new record or single or whatever it is ep it's like know. in and out like my son would release a song a week mm -hmm. fully produced right and he's like, Dad, I've released 52 songs in a year. How about your band? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, And you're like, it's quality, not quantity. Exactly. Yeah. But of course, I didn't want to read on his No, career. it's just that we're old school. Know. You know, we're, we grew up on a record 
yep. you know, or a cassette tape or whatever it was. And, you know, that was our tangible thing where we got immersed in that one thing for the life cycle of it until the next one comes out. And that's the world that we live in. Yeah. But the world of releasing things has changed so much, you know. Scott, before we land this mm -hmm. episode, what would you advise young kids who are mis misguided or are still finding their place in the world? Well, first thing, I mean, and I don't, any kid that's in that situation, I don't even need to say this, but find the thing that you love to love, whatever it may be that you're passionate about, whether it's sport, you know, or, or music or art or whatever it may be. It, it's all, it's all the same thing. It's all just something that you're passionate about. And, and what you want to do is really simple. You just need to put everything that you have into it. And uh, when you've done that, you're going to go even a little bit further and, and just push a little bit harder, you know, and, and to do your absolute best. And when you do that, it's just good things are going to happen. I sincerely believe it. I know it sounds crazy, but you look at YouTube these days and it's just like, oh, my gosh, these kids like, are, you know, the learning curve has become so fast for things. Yeah. It's not like in our time where we had to, we want to learn a song. On yeah, a record, mm -hmm. like we got to like take the needle off. Now they just go straight to YouTube and, and, and learn how to do these things so rapidly that they're shredding on us yeah. you know, at, at, a, at a young age that it's, it's just demoralizing. My son's nine and he codes. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> it's crazy, you know. Um, so whether it's computer stuff or maybe you want to make video games or whatever it might be, it's just... All it really is is just like just applying yourself as as much as you can to make some make it so that it's just undeniable. Like I said with the dishwall thing, like we have to make this so tight and so good that they have no choice than to sign us because there's there's, there's no they will be missing yeah. out. Yes, if and, and so that's really it. It's just self development for whatever it is and just pushing as hard as you can. You know, but recognize that, like what we talked about, there's going to be sacrifice involved, you know, whether it's going to be social life yeah. or or whatever. You know, my daughter's a ballerina. You know, she didn't have much social life through high school and stuff because it was just hours and hours and hours of dance, like for years. You know, it is what it is. Dang. Yeah. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Alexander. <laughs> Thank you, Parker. Wow. Appreciate it. Thank you.